Artificial influencer has gotten so popular now that there is even an Instagram model with 2.7 million followers and it's just a rendered face slapped on top of a real person. Well, the technology that was used may have been nothing new, but seeing a technique as old as this can garner that much followers in just a few years, what's stopping these AI startups from making AI influencers by using the latest AI technology to recreate something as big or even bigger than that 2D rendered Instagram model? Uh, actually, nothing is stopping them. In fact, AI-generated images has gotten even better in the past few months that makes me question myself, are the people running fake AI influencer accounts even trying? If you have been following my channel for a while, we have been on quite a journey for text-based AI-generated images. Two years ago, we first saw the rise of beautiful but incomprehensible images. Then a year later, the wave of big booba ladies illustrations brought a wave of interest into the field. Oh, I wonder wonder why. Six months ago, ultra realistic faces, or more specifically, beautiful Asian faces, oh god, I wonder why again, have surfaced with image qualities that were unimaginable years ago. And now, in contrast to before, not only the faces look so real, but also the entire image. The lighting, the shadows, the color, even the effect from camera lens can be generated from just text. So instead of having a 3D blender character trying to sell you gummy bears, the power of AI image generation might be something you want to keep your eyes on for the next few years so you don't accidentally throw money on a person that you thought were real. So continuing where we left off last time, we had a nice talk about model mixes where these insane AI models that can generate some super good images were made by taking the best models out of a few and combining their unit weights together to create a model that is stronger and capable of creating more aesthetic images. With the addition of LoRa that can learn specific characteristics about a style, face, type of clothing, or or literally anything that a phrase can describe with just a handful of training images, AI can now generate pretty much anything that not even your brain is capable of imagining. Now, we still have some crazier model mixes and merges, but it's really nothing new. They still use around the same techniques, and most of the popular ones are still being very secretive about how they're actually made. However, Laura has now evolved into too many different forms with different pros and cons, that at this point, I think the weebs just wanted to name a method after some anime like this version of Laura called the La Chorus. La Chorus. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> La Chorus. <laughs> A reference to an anime called Lacora's Recoil, which is an anime girl version of John Wick, and this method is slowly and silently gaining popularity in the AI fine-tuned space. And to be more accurate, I kind of lied. Lacora's is not a version of Laura, but a shorthand for Laura beyond conventional methods, other rank adaptation implementations for stable diffusion, which is a way to collectively call anything that is mathematically similar to Laura. Weeps have named them out of an anime method. I mean, it does. Sound Sound better than LBC Morai SD, and not gonna lie, making an anime as a mascot is a pretty good promotional method for this tech. Okay, okay, guys, the author just told me it was actually based on the flower Lycoris, but was bombarded with weebs asking if it's an anime reference, so he gave in. What a poor guy. Anyways, in this collection, there are two notable Laura variations that may become extremely popular in the near future. The first one is called Locon, short for Laura for convolutional layer. To put it simply, the original Laura only trains the transformer block, which is the part that encodes your prompt, shown in green. This lets the AI connect the concept and the trigger word together so you can guide it to generate something you want after training. However, Locon doesn't just train the transformer block exclusively, but also the res block shown in yellow. Usually, you would train the res block in order to change some mathematical properties of the denoising flow like noise offset or pyramid noise. But in general, training both blocks maintains some more details from the original reference image compared to Laura. So Locon can be said to have a better identity preservation mechanism. And the second one is called Loha. What it does is that it combines two Lora together into one using a method called the Hadamard product. So it theoretically has a better expressiveness than Lora. What's even better is that Loha is better at combining styles with characters. So it can be said that Loha trains more style than Locon, while Locon trains more style than Lora. Even though the differences between them can be subtle, it is still recognizable that there is an improvement which Lora 
Nora stands inferior to. There are even more methods beside these two, like Loker and Dialora, but at this point there's just too many of them with not much significance, so all of them are passed off as a collective. So theoretically, Loha and Lokon are better than Laura. However, they have been around ever since March. If it's actually better, then why haven't we seen it dominate the scene? Well, there are a few speculations that I can make like how the differences is not that significant, so it doesn't really give people a strong enough reason to convert. On top of that, there is also the hassle of insulting something completely new. But the most reasonable answer is that Laura has been around longer, so people tend to stick around stuff with much more resources and support than something brand new with loads of uncertainties. Like just look at any of the pre-existing Lauras that are extremely popular right now. There are ones used to generate Polaroid image effects. There are ones that are used to create better contrast, fix image lighting, or even add details to an image generated by a model. The usage of Lauras have truly expanded beyond simply learning someone's art style and copying them. But what's the difference between Laura and textual inversion? Well, in short, Laura understands the connection between the concept and the trigger word and have the power to edit the generating noise, while textual inversion is just translating the trigger word into numbers that the model can use. So Laura can be applied freely with any model because it understands about its trigger word, while you cannot guarantee the effectiveness of textual inversion outside of the model it was trained from. So some people then incorporate a range of different Laura's and negative textual inversions like easy negative or bad hands to create a desired output, which has made the prompt in text to image generation look like writing some alien glyphs instead of actually describing something. But don't worry, it gets worse. Text to image is no longer text to image. It's more like text plus 20 other extensions to image because there are just so many new ways to fix or improve the image to get an even better result. When you see a high resolution AI generated image as good as this, it's not something directly baked out of the oven with only a fine tuned model in some Loras. Including high res fix doesn't even do that. Tools like After Detailer are often used to improve major features of the image like the face, the hands, and even the body in some cases. After Detailer is basically an automatic in painting tool that helps you fix the details that you separately prompt, and it would then improve these spots after you generated the main image. And for the other parts of the image that did not get fixed or improved with After Detailer, ControlNet Tile would come in and save the day. I mentioned ControlNet Tile briefly in my ControlNet 1.1 video, but to put it simply, it is just an image of super resolution ControlNet model that upscales the image in different tiles with the assistant of text prompts, so it would know what it is upscaling and generate details that are relevant to the larger image. Amazing, right? While the image is also way bigger, more details are needed to fill in the canvas too. So dynamic thresholding is a thing to let user obtain a higher CFG scale than normal to get the AI to create an image more in line with the input prompt while not completely going berserk and generate some modern money laundering pop art. But when the canvas is that big, how do you make sure your prompt will not interfere with each other? We talked about latent coupling last time where we can separate the image into different regions and prompt them accordingly. But other than that, there is also the break keyword that lets you separate your prompts into different chunks for the AI so when you describe something, you wouldn't get it onto another subject. But of course, the longer your prompt is, the more information the model will miss out. So there is definitely a good balance between spamming keywords and building a gambling addiction for pulling a good generated image. However, one month ago, these AI Enigma machines might come to an end and we may be able to go back to a simpler time. SDXL was released by Stability AI and holy crap, it is a huge level up compared to what Stable Diffusion 1.5 can do. For all the things I've mentioned above like the mixes, the merges, and whatsoever, they were all based on SD 1.5. But now with SDXL, a new base model that's trained on the resolution of 1024 by 1024 incorporated with a refiner that's like a built-in image detail adder, SDXL might just change the entire lens of AI generated images for the next few months. Or not. Well, you see, even though SDXL base model that has no fine tuning can already generate images that look this real, it is not really usable for most people because it struggles to run on computers with less than 8 GB of VRAM. Not only that, even if they are able to somehow get it running, they would be generating an image per minute. 
and that is insanely slow compared to SD 1.5 with 5 different LoRa stacked on top of each other and 10 other extensions running in the background. However, if you're lucky and have a GPU that is 3090 or above, you would then be blessed with the opportunity to try out the greatness that is SDXL. It has also been implemented with Tensor RT, so we will definitely see a lot of speed up soon. But something that is worth noting is that, similar to Midjourney V5, it generates these pseudo photorealism images by abusing the bokeh effect. That just perfectly and conveniently blurs out the background that is usually a quick giveaway to tell if the AI model is good or not and if an image is real or not. It gives people a full sense of depth of field to make people think the quality is better, which in many cases may affect how the models are evaluated, because most of the time the model evaluation is based on user ratings. I don't know if this is a bad direction to take in, but when the artifacts or the bad details are camouflaged within the first few glimpses of an image, the model will get biased towards that style of generation which only please people aesthetically but not actually good at generating the details. So there could potentially be cases that the improvements may not be as big as people describe because the AI just adds blurs in the background and this is something we have not seen before. So a cycle of feedback from user ratings thinking it is getting incredibly better but actually only slightly can result in a misdirection of the AI model and to get distracted from getting better at generating realistic images. But yeah, that's just a random thought of mine. Anyways, SDXL did learn to generate much more details and is better because its based resolution is much higher. By the way, these are the recommended resolutions to generate in SDXL. But what's even more exciting about SDXL other than its resolution is that it is incredibly good at being fine-tuned. It learns faces or subjects super accurately and some early test results just gives a lot of hope for people that will fine-tune a super large amount of images later on. And roughly one month after SDXL's publication, some extensions for SD 1.5 are finally catching up a bit onto SDXL's development. We now have different open pose and canny edge control nets. Temporal net for SDXL called Temporal XL was announced. Merge models between SDXL are slowly coming out as people get used to the training parameters, but the development is definitely much slower because people haven't really found the right fine tuning parameters, especially for a model that is this big and expensive to train. So we probably won't hear anything big for a few more weeks. For the fellow weebs, waifu diffusion is exactly in the same fine tuning situation where they struggle quite much finding the right parameters. But they show me some progress they have right now and holy crap, waifu diffusion excels results are pretty amazing, especially it is only at around 10% of its overall fine tuning process and already surpassed the level that waifu diffusion 1.5 was on. Keep in mind that this is gonna be the base model for all of the future SDXL anime models, just like how waifu diffusion 1.5 has brought to the AI weaves to build on to get something this impressive now, so definitely let them cook. On the other hand, as SDXL is pretty new and it has a brand new AI architecture, so far it struggled pretty hard and is still struggling being picked up by most of the open source GUI. Stuff that doesn't load, extensions that don't work, there's a lot of things that are breaking when it comes to running SDXL on a GUI. The most stable one right now to run SDXL on is Comfy UI, however, the control net author Lumen Zeng wrote a new type of GUI just for SDXL called Focus or focus with a very interesting plot twist giving the users the least amount of control. Completely opposite to what all of the pre-existing GUIs are doing, Focus focuses on running SDXL optimally and generating good images with prompts as short as possible. How? Focus has incorporated some of the state-of-the-art ways to generate images like the ones I mentioned today. You don't even get to choose your own samplers or CFG value, which can be hated by some people, but it is definitely a great way for newcomers to start experiencing the greatness that is SDXL. Oh, and did I mention that it runs on a 6GB VRAM with 1.35 seconds per iteration? Even after the refiner and the LoRa's are loaded. That is absolute insane. So folks, there is still hope to optimize SDXL even further. And if you think about it, Lumen Zeng just casually made this SDXL GUI that is pretty much crazily optimized just after a few weeks as CXL is published. Just how talented is this guy? But yeah, let's end this video on someone accidentally generated with XCXL Refiner but not the base model, which is a perfect segue to bring our sponsor today, Brilliant.org. How is that perfect you say? Well, it's not perfect, but I know that Brilliant is a perfect place to start learning about ML, AI, or literally any STEM field as a beginner. Brilliant 
Julia provides a great introductory way to learn a new concept because it first provides you with some amazing intuitions before you dive into the hellhole that may be calculus or linear algebra. In my high school years, I actually used it to help myself understand what calculus is talking about and how to visualize the volume of revolution. Not only that, research has shown that interactive learning helps you learn six times more effectively than watching lecture videos. So with brilliant fun hands-on lessons in math, science, and computer science, you can easily surf through them without having trouble understanding them visually. Not only that, Brilliant also provides a clear roadmap on different subjects for all knowledge levels, from basic algebra to advanced multivariable calculus, from programming with Python to artificial neural networks. Brilliant is full of STEM courses that are usually a pain to study in but made into a much friendlier and digestible format. If you're interested in all the AI stuff I talked about today and want to get started in the field of machine learning or AI, Brilliant is a great place for you to build your math skills, coding skills, and ML skills once you're familiar with all the concepts. So yeah, quickly get started on Brilliant by heading to brilliant.org slash bycloud to get started for a free 30 days experience with Brilliant's ever-expanding interactive lessons and the first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off an annual membership. And thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Let me know down in the comments what you think or if I missed anything and a big shout out to Andrew Lascellius, Chris Ledoux, Alex J, Alex Ruiz, Deegan, Miguel Lim, Fifal, Daddy Wun, and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. But follow my Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.